Okay, let's go. Um, thanks for coming, everyone. This is our penultimate talk in the series. Um, very excited to have Stefan Kalini here tonight. Um, I hope you are. Um, he is a professor of intellectual history and English literature at the University of Cambridge. He's the author of a number of highly acclaimed books, including um, Absent Minds, which is a history of British intellectuals. I didn't know he had any. Um, a collection of essays on critics and historians called Common Reading, Critics and Historians Who Wrote for Non-Specialist Readers. And most significantly for our purposes, for the purposes of this talk and this series, he wrote a book in 2011 called What Are Universities For? Um, he's also a regular contributor to London Review of Books, in which he writes or has written, among many other things, some of the most, if not the most, incisive and withering critiques of uh, recent developments in higher education. So uh, let's hear it for Stefan. Thank you, Anthony. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I should just make clear, as the setup here probably indicates, that I'm not going to be using any PowerPoint. I'm not going to be using <laughs> any of those visual aids, which is one of my students told me rather artlessly that he liked because, as he said, it gives us something to think about while you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> so you will have to just concentrate on talking. But I was saying to uh, Anthony and Bob beforehand that I particularly <coughs> like the um, question and answer period for these sorts of uh, events. So the things that uh, are not clear in what I say or that you disagree with or that I failed to mention, please put me straight afterwards. Now, in the past century and a half, there have been numerous books and essays which address, in different guises, the idea of the university. And I think there's a recurrent pattern evident across all these different kinds of books. The main premise of these books is that the university ought, ideally, to be understood as the home of economic and utilitarian purposes, but that it's currently under threat from measures that embody the contrary values of learning and cultivation. So instead of a pragmatic commitment to training students for jobs and applying technology in ways that directly benefit the economy, both government policies and wider opinion are more and more forcing universities to become centres of open-ended inquiry, transmitting a belief in the value of the life of the mind. So this literature, I think, takes the form of a call to arms. That is, what has been precious about universities, principally their service role in the economy, is uniquely imperiled in the present generation, and so it falls to those who understand and care about the true purposes of universities, politicians and business leaders above all, to rally round before it's too late. The proper vocational, applied and technocratic identity of the university has already been badly eroded, and it's now on the point of being completely overwhelmed by an engulfing tide of pure scholarship. <laughs> well, you politely smile, but I want just to stay with the slight cognitive dissonance <coughs> that this way of putting things stirs up. Because I want to ask, why has the pattern been exactly the reverse of that which I've just playfully described? Why would that pattern that I've described be seen as, in some sense, self-evidently absurd, when the reverse is, on the whole, what we're used to. After all, if what we might call for a shorthand, the instrumental and the ideal understandings of the university have been the two main rival accounts, you might think that each would have its champions, each would have its periods of being dominant or on the defensive, and so on. But to judge by the various statements that have been written, in the last century or two about the idea of the university, <coughs> it hasn't been like that at all. It's always that the idea of the open-ended inquiry function is in some way on the, dis on the defensive, and that the economic service function is in some way becoming overly dominant. Why has this been the case? I think once we become aware of just how repetitive 
this pattern has been. There are some other questions to ask as well. Why is it that all the celebrated statements seem to be on just one side of the divide? Why is, no, is it the case that no deathless prose has been written about the idea of servicing the economy or training the workforce? And is that because those purposes are not seen to need any rhetorical assistance? Or in fact, is the very idea of an instrumental or utilitarian justification actually just a straw man, just made up by those who want to represent themselves as upholding some more ambitious or nobler ideal? What I've discovered is that the measures which each generation of champions of the idea of the university complain about are nearly always introduced by statements, often from politicians or administrators, that actually pay service to the idea of the university literature of the previous generation. And then you begin to think, well, the asymmetry is very marked, isn't it? Not only do the idea of university people write all their own lines, they write all the best lines for their opponents, too. And then there is the question of quite why it is so repetitive, because not only does one side, if you think of it like that, not win a decisive and enduring victory, but similar terms of argument, similar moves are made in each generation. So why is that? Why, if the circumstances are new, does that not give rise to entirely new arguments? Or, looking at the other way around, if the case was stated so unforgettably and powerfully by a writer several generations ago, what need is there to restate it now? So, asking these questions, I thought what I would do this evening is concentrate not so much on the content of these statements, but on the medium itself. What's going on in this genre of writing? Now, it's certainly not difficult to state the hostile case against this genre. <laughs> in fact, one of my closest and dearest friends stated it to me very pithily. I said I was uh, preparing earlier this year this lecture, and I was going to talk about the idea of university literature, and he said, well, wasn't that an intrinsically arid and pointless form of writing? <laughs> well, it is, I think, damned quite often for its lack of realism, uh, its preference for mellifluous generalities over useful practical suggestions. And it is said to have a conservative or nostalgic character very often. Obviously, this kind of writing tends to be stimulated by the threat or the actuality of new measures, new measures that respond to some kind of social change. And so it can seem to be resisting those very social changes, often social changes that we might welcome as part of a wider democratization of our society. So there is something defensive built into it, it often seems, something that seems almost as if it wants to stand up for the privileges of yesterday's elite. Now I think this hostile way of seeing this literature does uh, fail to address one interesting feature of it, I'll go on to the more obvious failings in a moment, but one is the durability of this kind of writing. That's to say, even though the circumstances change, these books and essays get cited over and over again. The most obvious example of this uh, clearly is Newman's idea of university. I've written about this elsewhere, but it is very striking that although even when it was written in the mid-19th century, it was already referring to circumstances which had passed away with early 19th century Oxford, so not only was it not applicable then, it's been even less applicable in any direct sense, sense since. And yet, and yet, no work is cited more often. And that's true of several of the other contributions to this genre over the past hundred years or so. They have frequently re-invoked. Let me just mention a few of these. I'll confine it to books in English, books written in Britain and America. And in fact, I think the best starting point for the 20th century is the classic of this genre, Thorsten Veblen's The Higher Learning in America, which was published in 1918, and I'll say something about it in a moment. But there's quite a long list, I'm not going to cite all of them, but for some of you may know Abraham Flexner's Universities, Bruce Truscott's Redbrick University, which gave a name to that category, <coughs> published in 1943, Levis's Education and the University, 
Walter Nobley, the crisis in the university, 1949, and go on and on. And just in recent years, uh, I've counted up half a dozen from the 1990s, of which I'm going to talk in a moment mainly about Bill Redding's book, uh, The University in Ruins. Now, what I'm not going to discuss are a related body of writing about the humanities. Again, this has been obviously a current literature and sometimes also somewhat similarly defensive literature, um, but I think that's got some of different things to be said about it and rather more restricted. I'm also not going to talk about some of those major official statements, like, for example, the 1945 Harvard Report on General Education, so-called Harvard Red Book, or the Robbins Report in this country on higher education in 1963, which certainly had influential things to say about the idea of university, but obviously were couched in very different terms. And I'm going to talk just about these books which self-consciously, in some way, attempt to pin down what they think is the core idea of the university and why it's under threat in their generation. Now, it might seem surprising, I suppose, to say that if you want some insight into the brave new world into which our universities in Britain are now moving, a very good place to start would be a book written a century ago in another country, and that is Weber's The Higher Learning in America, which is a brilliant indictment of misapplied commercialism. Let me give you a brief illustration. Consider his description of the way the dominant business ethos believes it must be possible to reduce all learning to standard units of time and volume, and so control and enforce it by a system of accountancy and surveillance. The methods of control, accountancy and coercion that so come to be worked out have all that convincing appearance of tangible efficiency that belongs to any mechanically defined and statistically accountable routine. Yes, that convincing appearance of tangible efficiency. <coughs> How would we fill our days without it? Um, but what I think he pinpoints even better in a way is the way in which the external pressure to represent universities in some ways that can be recognised in terms derived from the commercial business world has this distinctive effect in terms of quantification and measurement. Or, since I think he's good fun to quote, I shall quote two or three bits of him, um, consider this specification of what it needs to be a president, that is to say, a, like a principal or vice-chancellor of a British university. As to the requirements of scholarly or scientific competency, a plausible speaker with a large gift of assurance a business-like educator or clergyman, some urbane pillar of society, some astute veteran of the scientific demi <coughs> will meet all reasonable requirements. I have to say, I think that uh, astute veteran of the scientific demi I've met on various committees before now. Um, and then finally, uh, about the kinds of public statements that universities, under these sorts of pressures, tend to make. Hence, he says, the peculiarly, not to say exuberantly, inane character of this brand of oratory, coupled with an indefatigable optimism and good nature. And again, I think we recognise that. I mean, there's a few things make the flesh crawl more than the kind of unctuous corporate uplift that universities feel obliged to adopt these days to placate certain external powers. Now, part of what gives Weber's critique, I think, its perennial vitality is this sharpness of his perception of the clash between fashionable economic models and the real nature of untrammeled inquiry. He may seem, I think, to us to be rather high-handed when he writes, no scholar or scientist can become an employee in respect of his scholarly or scientific work. But actually, I think he's pointing to an interesting and enduring tension in the role of the salaried searcher after truth. And he acutely identifies how the market model leads to an overemphasis on making a university competitive, with everything devoted, as he says, to acquiring prestige, expanding numbers, keeping up positive appearances. This concern with the management of appearances results, he says, in statistical display, spectacular stage properties, vainglorious make-believe, and obsequious concessions to worldly wisdom. Again, 
obsequious concessions to worldly wisdom seems to me quite a useful phrase for a lot of what we encounter at the moment. And Weber was very insistent that there are a lot of functions which the university was accruing in his time which he thought were inimical to the true cause of scholarly and scientific research. He's fairly severe on some of the professional and vocational schools in American universities. And in fact, he emphasizes that undergraduate education itself has to be linked to such open-ended inquiry. Otherwise, the university just becomes, as he says, a glorified high school. Now, what I think is striking about Weber's Baroque sarcasms is that they're clearly the vehicle for the classic tropes of cultural criticism. That is, misconceived machinery threatens to throttle the true nature of open-ended inquiry. An alien language is colonizing the minds of those who should be the defenders of such inquiry. And, particularly striking, I think, is his confidence that popular sentiment supports the true idea of university rather than the fashionable commercial distortions of that idea. He speaks, last quotation from him, he speaks of this massive hedge of slow but indefeasible popular sentiment that stands in the way of making seats of learning over into something definitively foreign to the purpose which they are popularly believed to serve. So he's not just saying that However powerful the forces of darkness may be, his readers will recognise some truth in his message. He thinks this is a deep-seated intuition among the wider public, and that this is what those who wish to speak up for universities need to appeal to. Now, from much more recent contributions to this genre, I'm just going to take one example uh, before going on to some more general points. But this is uh, probably one of the most widely cited, which is Bill Redding's 1996 book, The University in Ruins. I suppose Redding's book might most economically be characterised as an attempt to rethink the modern university through the categories of late 20th century literary theory. So in Redding's view, the modern university is initially theorised by Kemp, Humboldt and the early 19th century German idealists, and is based on the union of reason and culture, or in educational terms in, in Germany, Wissenschaft and Bildung. I think the main interest of Redding's book lies in its central trope, that is, of the modern university as now an institution in ruins. He contends that it's lost whatever informing idea it may once have possessed, and he has some very telling pages, which again I think we would all recognise, of how the empty category of excellence now expresses this situation. The university, he says, is an administered set of activities united by no more than the fact that they derive from an earlier, more restricted set of activities that were carried on in institutions of this name. Though there is now no agreement on what this range of activities should be. And he says it's an institution without any transparent social function that intelligibly links these activities to the presumed needs of society. I have to say, I think here he concentrates probably too much on the humanities and neglects the way in which a great array, array of applied scientific and social scientific inquiries actually don't lack any intelligibility as being useful to society. But I think he is interesting and acute about the situation of the humanities, um, especially as applied to the elective system common in most American liberal arts modern universities, where he says they function as a supplement to the tourist industry, with partly interested, partly bored trippers traipsing round the sites to which our predecessor cultures attached value. Now, it's much harder to say what Reddings recommends we should now do we should, it seems, inhabit the ruins with some sense of postmodern irony, while also pragmatically using them to explore the limits of what can be thought. So, I guess he's suggesting we should still call this the university and still see it as the site or occasion for the practice of dissensus. A dissensus not redeemed by any belief in ultimate agreement, even in the agreement to differ. But I suppose, as with all states of methodological self-consciousness, one of the problems with this redescription 
in terms of literary theory systematic collapsing of every category, is that it makes it hard to see how we decide to do any one thing in particular. Taken to its limits, Reading's argument would seem to suggest that the whole university will become a kind of continuous seminar mixing philosophy and cultural studies, endlessly questioning the proposed object of study. Now, Reading says that he wishes to resist the pure consumerism of uh, the official version of student choice, but he doesn't actually provide any rationale for any one object of study rather than another. And so, of course, the risk is that that pattern of consumer choice will, by default, end up dictating his so-called post-historical university. So I think there are difficulties. Nonetheless, this is a very interesting contribution to the idea of the university. It's not about any one university. He writes mainly about American universities, but as a, an Englishman, he's now dead, but as an Englishman who taught in a French-speaking university in Montreal in Canada, uh, and who worked on German literature, among other things, it's got a very wide range. He also disclaimed any nostalgia for the original university of culture, and instead he's alerting his audience, and again this is surely the classic move of the cultural critic, he's alerting his audience to something that is going wrong in the present generation. So this is in a way the idea of the university for the 1990s, for the advanced literary <coughs> theorist rethinking what this old ideal should now yield us. And I have to say I think it still has much to recommend it. Now, although I am for the moment treating these various contributions to this genre as uh, having a lot in common, obviously if we want to take any one in in particular, we could spend a long time unravelling the differences and also saying something about the particular circumstances that provoked them, particular policies they were responding to, and so on. But one thing I want to do by looking at the rhetoric of these different performances is bring out something that I think is very similar in them. And one way to address this repetition is to note the way that all these classic works claim to be merely restating some familiar truths. So this idea of university literature nearly always claims to be reinterpreting in the idiom of its own time the ideal of free inquiry which it alleges has been at the heart of the conception of the modern university since at least the end of the 18th century when the modern university started to take its present form. So this, perhaps we should regard as a regulative ideal. One, its proponents are prone to feel it's constantly neglected or overridden in practice, hence the need for it to be restated so often. At the same time, from the perspective of the proponents of social needs, there's an equally constant opposite process of academic drift at work across these generations, whereby the practical purposes that universities were often set up to serve are being neglected because of this concentration on open-ended inquiry which, it is alleged, makes them deviate from their initial social purpose. So you could say where the idea of the university literature is constantly trying to crystallise what's entailed by this commitment to open-ended inquiry, the needs of society statements are constantly attempting to rein in the consequences of an excessive attachment to that ideal as it's allegedly shaped academic development. Now clearly this sort of literature, the ideal of the university, has been one indirect way of articulating a conception of society which registers some dissonance or, or lack of fit between its determining economic practices and the life of the mind. Seeing how powerfully and effectively the imperatives of the commercial world remake society in their own image generates a kind of unease, or if you like, a surplus, a sense of the more to human life, more than having a job or making money, that we can't quite shake ourselves free from, and yet we can't also easily integrate into our everyday arrangements. 
I suppose institutions like museums and libraries or theatres and galleries are among the other types of institutions that generate this sense, but of course they're more specialised and not primarily involved in education. Whereas universities, I think, can seem to embrace both more unspecialised or unlimited aspiration and more practical and measurable social goals. Universities, I think, in this way are doomed to be homes both to instrumentality on a large scale and to the critique of that instrumentality. This is a tension that cannot be wholly wished away or resolved, and hence, I think, in part, the repetitiveness of this literature. Now, I've never much cared, for obvious reasons, for the old incantation that alleges those who can do, those who can't teach, <coughs> those who can't teach, teach teachers. A very dreary sentiment, I think. But let me offer you a relevant adaptation of the rhythm of that. If you want to make money, go into business. If you want to learn how to make money, go to business school. If you want to learn what money is and how it has functioned and what might be the point of making a lot of it, go to university. <laughs> now, of course, that has the defects of all those brisk and knowing uh, phrases of that kind. But I think it does gesture to one aspect of what has been taken to be distinctive about the activities of universities. And that is that second order questions of that latter kind, what money is and how it's functioned, what might be the point of making it and so on. Second order questions of that kind always have the tendency to relativise the primary activities which are questioned in this way, to make them seem in some way more contingent or limited or just questionable. And hence such reflection and scrutiny inevitably imports some notion of critique. <laughs> I don't share the view, I should say, that the university is defined by a commitment to critique or even oppositionality. It seems to me to culpably oversimplify and indeed over-romanticise the role of universities. But I do think it's true, and I'm trying to explain this on other occasions, that the very open-endedness of inquiry that's required <coughs> if fresh understanding is to happen and be communicated that has a tendency to generate these second-order questions, which in turn start to challenge the implicit premises of the practical purposes for which such inquiry was instituted in the first place. In a way, you could say the paradox of universities in their modern form is that they are bound to be simultaneously subservient to and distant from, and at the limit, even critical of, the dominant economic processes of society. And I think maybe that helps to explain, if you think explanation is needed, why there's no such distinguished tradition of writing about, say, the idea of the accounting firm or the idea of the refuse collection service. Now, it may seem at points too obvious and even perhaps too cheap to need to be made, but I think it's a way of reminding us that there are large hopes of a nebulous kind invested in the idea of the university hopes that can't be met simply by improving the operational efficiency of an institution. It's that surplus of meaningfulness that I mentioned earlier, and which does not, I think, apply in those other cases. And this surely bears on the asymmetry I pointed to. The tradition of literature on the idea of the university can't be genuinely paralleled by a comparable body of writing that asserts the priority of the instrumental needs society constantly wants universities to meet. Because these claims tend to be made instead in ways that are much more immediate, practical, patchy, pragmatic, and often embedded in one or another kind of official document. After all, where the idea of the university writing tends to take the form of books or a string of essays by figures who are quite close to universities, the pragmatic case tends on the whole to be stated by politicians, journalists, businessmen, and administrators of various kind in other more limited sorts of documents. But if they don't have a common form, these latter statements, needs of society, as I'm calling them, they also have a small number of recurrent themes. They typically tend to convict universities of being too introverted, too sluggish, 
too prone to the vices of scholasticism and, of course, too unresponsive to the needs of the economy. It's what you might call the ivory tower indictment, except that seems to me to confer some legitimacy on that terribly tired and empty cliché. But this is a pattern that we can trace at least as far back as the campaign by the Edinburgh Review against Oxford University in the early 19th century. All those points I've just made are evident in the criticism then, and they've been repeated over and over again. And I'm sure you've all encountered statements from those who purport to represent the needs of society, railing against the self-perpetuating character of academic life, its unjustifiable privileges, and its divorce, above all, from something called reality, which these spokesmen are great experts about. I mean, I'm tempted mischievously to suggest that these pronouncers are, contrary to their intentions, actually testifying to something about the attraction of the idea of open-ended intellectual inquiry. Because they see that that's what constantly drags universities away from these more immediate instrumental aims. <coughs> and they also see, I think, that the kind of autonomy that academics claim as the essential precondition of fruitful intellectual work is constantly open to abuse. That's to say the conditions of work that favour genuine originality of thought also appear to favour shirking and loafing. I think it's rather as with periodic battles that we're familiar with about welfare policy where one side sees the systematic benefits of adequate provision and the other concentrates on such a system's vulnerability to exploitation by the lazy and unscrupulous. Now we now may not want to go quite as far as the Liberal Cabinet Minister Lord Haldane did in 1912 when he declared, it is in universities that the soul of a people mirrors itself. But however hard-headed we try to be, we can't altogether discount the fact that universities do always seem to be endowed with or to attract in their discussions this surplus of meaningfulness that I mentioned earlier. And that just does not seem to happen in the same way with other forms of institutions. It's not, in that sense, surprising that, let's say, apprenticeship schemes haven't generated their Newman, uh, or that the Institute of Chartered Accountants haven't been berated by their Weber, and so on. Now, the question of uh, what has um, stimulated the constant revival of this uh, appeal to the surplus of meaningfulness, I think, is itself an interesting question that I have used to put afterwards. In some ways, the very antiquity of the model of the university is in play, I think. And it's clear that universities have continued to benefit from a wider cultural prestige even now. It's a striking fact, if you work at all on the history of these institutions, to notice that whereas several other types of institutions over the last 150 years have converted themselves into, or in some way been re-described as universities, there's no flow in the other direction. And that's something else to take into account. I think it's a little like a question um, Anthony mentioned that I'd written a book about intellectuals some years ago, and there are kind of recurrent aporias on the subject of intellectuals, which in the end seem to me to testify to something that won't quite go away. We can be dismissive of the whole idea, and yet also there is some yearning that maybe the model of the intellectual could represent something we would like to be the case about the play of intelligence and public life and so on. And I think in a similar way, there's something about the idea of the university that just won't go away for the same reason. Now, as I said when I was talking about Weber, another interesting question to ask is who these pieces of writing are addressed to, what literary theorists might call the implied addressee of the prose. It's very striking that with Weber and uh, Abraham Flexner, whom I mentioned, another American uh, contributor to this literature, they have sweeping condemnations of American higher education, which they see as expressing the deep commercial character of American society. <coughs> and yet, you find yourself asking, well, if that commercial character is so dominant, then 
it's not immediately clear where sympathetic readers are going to be found for these critical messages. And yet it is, as I've already hinted, a recurrent feature of this literature, and I think of cultural criticism more generally, that the appeal to self-evidence is one of its central argumentative moves. Many of these writers simply hold up for us some example of what seems to them to be the inane stupidity of contemporary measures and don't often need to comment further. The reader is assumed to be able to recognise the inanity immediately. And I suppose if all cultural criticism has what might be called uh, a utopian element, a horizon of hope, then it has to assume that in some way that's recognisable to its readers. Because if not, there'd be no vantage point from which these contemporary measures could be criticised at all. And I think that is a very deep feature of this literature. Now, I'm going to change gear for the final section of this lecture and address some questions that bear more on the future. I think one uh, unsurprising truth that we might learn from considering the long literature on the idea of the university is that each generation fails to envisage not just the path of future change, but also how universities may adapt to this change without ceasing to be recognisably universities. So various changes are greeted as signalling the end of the world as we know it. And yet, somehow, a world that we didn't know and didn't foresee turns out to be not too bad in the end after all. For example, the rise of industrialism didn't mean that only subjects directly related to industrial production came to be studied in universities. And the same may now be true of the financialization of the world. The rise of credit default swaps does not signal the inevitable end of the study of English literature any more than the rise of the Bessemer converter announced the demise of classics. But of course, on the other hand, <coughs> classics occupies a vastly smaller place in the university now, if it occupies any place at all in so many universities, than 150 years ago it did. And there are very intelligible reasons of social change why that has happened. So it would be foolish to think that social and economic developments now underway may not bring significant changes to universities of the future, but does this long tradition of writing about them, about universities that is, help us reflect on how universities might absorb or adapt to some of these changes? Or do we have to go with more apocalyptic current predictions? Now, those apocalyptic predictions. Those who are confident that the unprecedented pace of change in the present is unique and makes all previous experience largely irrelevant tend to base their case on what they see as the two great transforming agencies at work, summed up as globalisation and the revolutionary power of new technology. So on this view, if universities are imagined as the direct expression of the age of global capital, then it's argued there is no reason for them to be funded by a particular <coughs> state. They simply become one means for players in a market to seek advantage, and those players can come from anywhere. Therefore, the relation should be that of customer to provider, not of citizen to state. And it's said the new technology reinforces this. There is no need to be physically in one place rather than another. The only connection between a university and a student that is essential is the ability to click on a credit card account. Indeed, even the language of promoting national economic needs is fundamentally at odds with a truly global picture, as of course the masters of global capital realise all too well. HSBC, for example, is not concerned with Britain's national needs any more than that so-called British hedge fund, which has its offices in a Swiss canton to avoid tax, is concerned with it. As far as such commercial enterprises are concerned, what we call countries simply figure as sets of trading conditions. One has a more flexible labour market, that is more flexible about sacking people. Another has a supportive fiscal regime, that is supportive of making and retaining large profits. 
And similarly, if it provides a better return on investment to get your training in Singapore, to start building future networks at MIT, to pick up a useful dollop of cultural capital at Oxford and so on, then those are the decisions, it is said, that global consumers will make. All the relevant goods can be priced into the market. For those who want to see British universities largely funded by the British taxpayer, and filled to some extent by British students, can be portrayed as survivals from the era of the nation state, or indeed even as the educational equivalents of UKIP. Now, techno futurologists go further still and ask whether, if everything that has previously been done face to face can now be done online, does location matter at all? If a university is a brand, why should it not sell in all available markets? <coughs> if a library is in effect just a website, and a lecture is in effect just an internet clip, and if an exam is in effect just a machine-graded multiple answer quiz, why not just enrol everybody, wherever they are? What were once brand name doctrines, only obtainable from a particular source, have now become over-the-counter commodities, obtainable anywhere. Or, let me garble another common cultural reference, the study of almost any discipline has now become a je sans frontière, couched in a sophisticated dialect of globish, Universally available introductory passages constitute the canon of the internet age, just as online reviews <coughs> turn literary criticism into a variant of TripAdvisor. The metaphor of inside the walls has long survived the functional demise of such architectural <coughs> structures themselves. Now, the only relevant kind of wall is a paywall. As you can see, I enjoyed ventriloquizing this particular point of view uh, and uh, gave it a little more rhetoric than it allows itself sometimes. Mm -hmm. Still, I think there is a lot of exaggeration built into that doom and grim perspective. And that exaggeration starts, it seems to me, to undermine its case. As I said, it's notorious that we have been very bad over the generations at anticipating the effects of the kinds of changes that have been identified. And I think we're being very bad if we follow these exaggerations now. One prediction I would make is that in 50 or 100 years' time, there will still be fresh examples of the idea of the university literature. That's to say, I think the drive by markets and capital to mould human existence to its will is not going to lessen. And so the flickering and uncertain recognition that universities are one, only one, but one major expression of a different ideal of open-ended search for fuller understanding, that's not going to entirely go away. So I suppose such writing, we might say, reminds us of the slippage between what is humanly valuable and what is merely unnoticed or accepted or fashionable. The ceaseless rhythm of the waves of everyday life causes a deposit of insensibility to build up that clogs our perceptions and dulls our responsiveness. Procedures established for a series of transient and ad hoc reasons acquire that patina of inevitability with which economic logic needs to coat its operations <coughs> if we're not to rebel against its unconscionable exactions. And in rhetorical mode from now until the end, I wonder. <laughs> Alien language first invades our territory, then it settles and reproduces. And finally, in a familiar imperialist twist, it colonizes our minds and leads us to treat its barbarous, exploitative categories as a true description of our necessary state. The literature on the idea of the university, I think, constitutes a series of attempts to chip off some of that rhyme scale that corrodes the pipes of our thinking, allowing us to see the inappropriateness or even absurdity of terms and procedures that we're otherwise in danger of adopting as our own. So yes, this literature is repetitive, but in the way in which the application of any solvent has to be repeated, if it's to be at all effective in combating an unrelenting pressure. Yes, this literature is idealistic, but in the sense in which anything that calls us back to reflection about what makes life worth living can seem idealistic. Its function hasn't been to propose detailed alternative policies or arrangements, but to jolt us into recognising the mismatch between the arrangements that we are developing and what we thought were the true purposes of these institutions. 
And yes, this literature can sometimes seem nostalgic because it's protesting against the most recent form of these measures and that will sometimes look as though it's hankering after the situation of the day before yesterday. But actually, it doesn't have to do that. Precisely because it is a restatement, uh, it can be a restatement for our time in a way that is not at all nostalgic. And finally, yes, examples of this literature do continue to be read and reread long after the conditions they address have become historical curiosities because, this is my favourite metaphor of the whole piece, because the energy released by the collision between, on the one hand, the immovable mass of decayed half-truths and rotting cliches, and, on the other, the irresistible force of genuine ethical insight, functions like a prose version of the Large Hadron Collider. <laughs> I thought of crossing that out, <laughs> but then I thought, I like it too much. So, I would say, in conclusion, we don't have to admire everything about the great cultural critics of the past or even agree with any of their particular views to feel that the force of their writing remains generative of fertile thought for us now, even though we are in different circumstances. If we were to stop writing and rereading the literature on the idea of university, I think it would mean that we'd lost or suppressed the ability to identify the ways in which our current arrangements betray our understanding of what's distinctive about an odd institutional conceptual amalgam that we have inherited from previous generations and still call the university. And in reiterating that idea, we're not just banging our heads against a brick wall. I think we're doing what cultural criticism enables us to do, and that is to see that supposed wall as a piece just of stage drapery. It's another of ideology's insidious little tricks. It's because universities are so intimately bound up with the place which the extension of understanding has in human life, individually and collectively, that we can't simply bracket off fundamental questions about worth and purpose in a way that it's very sensible to do with a lot of other very practical or instrumental enterprises. So questioning whether the present arrangements do best serve what we think of as those purposes is not conservative or elitist or unrealistic or any of the other dismissive labels that busy people like to apply to them. I think it is an ineliminable aspect of the function that universities exist to serve. So if you feel that something's not quite right when you are told by your line manager that robust and transparent procedures are necessary if our deliverables are to be quantified in a way that makes us competitive in the global market, then you are already taking the first step in a process of reflection that eventually culminates in reading, or dare I even say writing, a book about the true purposes of universities. Of course, you may feel there is nothing at all wrong with the sentence I've just parodied, but in that case, I suspect you need an altogether different kind of professional help. <laughs> as I said, I very much like the question and answer period, and uh, please be as forthcoming as you wish. Okay, questions. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll get into the because I think I'll agree on, on the premises of this. Um, I'll, I'll pursue a little bit this idea that what is that concept that is constantly refined and redefined and repeated, and possibly um, whether we can try to trace it a little bit more. Um, a thing that was not covered very much by the literature that you covered is as a kind of link of the university with the systems. Sorry, I missed the word. Link with the link of the universities with the systems of their time. Nation state, for example. You know, 
and economy, you know. Um, and I, I just wonder to what extent that ideal task of the university has been <coughs> subsumed to some wider institutional structures and we might be doing a battle that is detracting us from what we should be actually doing. I, I hope it's kind uh, of... Just say one more phrase about what you meant by what we should be doing. Well, that's what I wonder. What is that thing we should be doing? What is the task <coughs> of the university? Can that task be taken out of the university and be done beyond the university, the nation state owned university, the economically banned university? Yeah, I mean, you'll have to come back if I don't answer it, yeah. I'm not sure I've quite got the final thrust of that. But the thing I, just to start with the history, and the thing that I want to emphasize is that there's been, I think, um, a repetitive dialectic since at least the early 19th century, which is that various bodies, not always the nation state, sometimes it could be local communities of some other kind, sometimes it can be um, some set of industrialists or whatever, have had the ambition to set up an institution which will serve some particular immediate purposes. So I'll just take one example. In the mid and late Victorian period, the universities that were established for the first time in the major industrial cities of Britain, Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, and so on, <coughs> very often grew out of local initiatives by a set of business leaders who wanted to provide the right kind of training and technology for their local industries. Over time, what has happened is that those universities came more and more to correspond to as a central or traditional idea of the university. They start having people who are there in order to, let's say, the Sheffield understand about metallurgy, but they end up generating people who are doing blue skies research in material science and so on, because that's the logic of the climate. And so, the complaint comes back that they've gone too far away from the universities. <coughs> now, I'm not saying, well, I think I'm not quite sure I've got the point of question, but I'm not saying that I think there was something, uh, as it were, at fault with that initial initiative from local bodies. That's been a recurrent form of that initiative. But it'll never entirely keep the lid on what <coughs> those who are given the opportunities to pursue deeper understanding start to find as the interesting questions. And it's one of the things I think, and, and this is where it uh, very much bears on now, um, as a historical example, something that bears very much on now is that the distinction, if we think there is one, between universities and the research labs of some <coughs> major companies. And if we take um, fields like pharmaceuticals, <coughs> aerospace industry or the computing industry, a great deal of research is done in the big labs which are maintained by Boeing and Glaxo and Microsoft and so on. And it would be silly to, to deny that that was the case. But the directions of those forms of research actually are constantly pulled back to the needs of those industries. They are not very sympathetic to what I was calling the second order questions, whether the language of the discipline has a particular character, whether it has relations with neighbouring disciplines, and so on. They continually pull back to the pragmatic purpose. Um, and that, it seems to me, helps us think about this recurrent characteristic of universities. Um, what, I, what I meant by saying is quite hard to put the lid on that kind of inquiry. And so I'm not trying to as well, arbitrate on whether they should be um, set up by, prompted by, one social force or social body or another. They, the bodies that have set them up have been various, I think, over the last 200 years. Um, not always the nation state in a simple way. But whichever it is, it seems to me that tension has replicated itself again and again. Now, I don't know if that addresses your question, but I just Yeah, okay. Mark? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I, I very much enjoyed, particularly, I, I enjoyed the, the, the metaphorical um, uh, 
indulge excess and <laughs> indulgence, um, which in a sense is the performance of, um, is performing exactly the argument that we meant. Um, you, you spoke about critique of all this solvent, a necessary solvent that points to the open-ended nature of the university, but you also suggested that this is an ongoing battle which is repeated through the generations. Um, and in doing so, I wonder if you have perhaps poured a different type of solvent on those uh, in the university now who claim that what is happening currently is unique mm. and is distinct and is potentially undermining, the, at least in Britain, the very idea of what the university has been for a long time. So, the, so I wonder to what extent, what I'm trying to get at is I wonder to what extent your argument supports the claim that actually would emerge from these battles um, in the manner we always have, the universities always have, and that the past uh, should also pour a solvent on those of us who are perhaps yeah. uh, too pessimistic. But then my question would be, does that not perhaps underplay some of what is going on currently, ranging from fees to the forms of evaluation? No, it's a very good question. Um, and I would first just say, and the speakers are prone to say this, um, I, I have tried to make clear on other occasions, in other writings, uh, I have noticed some of the changes, and they do seem to be very drastic. Um, I think I would have um, emphasized what you emphasize if you'd asked me that question uh, about a year ago, before I started reading this body of literature as extensively as I've been doing. Um, because I am very struck by the apocalyptic tone that occurs in these different critiques. Um, it, it would be a difficult task, I think, historically, to work out now whether the threats that they perceived were, as it were, of the same magnitude as the ones we now perceive. And it sometimes could be that they um, misdescribe something that's happening, or of course sometimes it could be that they cherish something which we don't want to cherish. Uh, I mean, some of the I, I certainly have very little sympathy with all those kinds of you know, more means worse arguments against expansion of education and higher education. Um, and so they would think that their apocalyptic predictions were wholly justified, and that the change was uh, totally destructive for what they believed was essential to universities. I, and probably you, wouldn't endorse that because we don't share the tendency. So I'm not now quite so uh, willing to believe that there won't be ways in which these institutions or something very much like them do nonetheless adapt to these new circumstances without losing everything that is recognised. Um, of the various uh, possible threats and changes, I have to say, although I think the change in technology is a huge force, of course, it would not, um, that, one does, that one I am less, as it were, worried about in that sense. Um, it seems to me that will force universities to identify more clearly, perhaps we have before, what is really essential about certain kinds of human contact face-to-face -face teaching and so on, <coughs> what are the transferential or uh, other therapeutic forces at work in, in that type of teaching that can't be replicated by a machine. Um, and I don't think that will, as it were, you know, bring the whole enterprise of teaching to an end. Whether the attempt to remake universities as outliers of the nation's commercial and economic enterprises can go as far as stopping them being something that applies to universities. That's what I'm less certain about, but I'm also not utterly pessimistic about. Uh, it seems to me one of the things that comes out of this literature, as I mentioned with Bacon, is the appeal to a deep-seated, perhaps not always very well articulated, sense among a wide population outside the university that there is something about this very narrow-minded economic model that doesn't sound right to them. There's something, when they think about what they might want their children to benefit from, um, 
even if they've not themselves been to universities, that there's something they want universities to do, something <coughs> about not just <coughs> discovering new forms of understanding, but as it were, curating and handing on those new forms of understanding, inducting others into thinking about them, <coughs> that they would be sorry to see lost. And so I think there is still some ground for thinking that a few will hold us. Okay, uh, Bob? Yeah, it, it, it's partly taking on from, from Mark's question. Um, you know, I like your optimism about neoliberalism that they're not going to utterly destroy the university. And yet the, the historical precedents that you're offering, I'm, I'm not so sure about. Um, it's an interesting observation that all sorts of universities, all sorts of institutions have become universities, but we haven't seen the reverse of that process. I, I sometimes wake up and think I'm seeing the reverse of that process today. Um, this university, for instance, uh, seems to be one of many which are rapidly transforming themselves into really rather bad parodies of the original institutions out of which Buddhist and Frederick universities grew. And that, if I'm right to be pessimistic about that, then I suppose my worry is that, that what you've just been saying about people always recognising the need for that's something that might be kicked out of people by what seems to me a uh, political revolution. Well, uh, I, I, hope I, I'm not. I sorry. I hope I'm not. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say actually, um, I have you know no more authority to answer this question than anyone else does. Really, I mean, I wouldn't claim to uh, have a crystal ball about this. Um, and you and I and everybody else, I think, recognises that the uh, how. <coughs> Concerted power, uh, institutional, economic, and political, that uh, bring about these changes, especially in the last two or three decades. So I'm not sure. I can't. I'm, I don't know that we can fruitfully, as we disagree about that. So it won't help anybody else. I would just go back to though, the point about um, my observation that various institutions have, as it were, transformed themselves into, or called themselves universities. Nothing much seems to have gone in the other direction. Um, what you say, uh, this university I take you to know about. Um, but it won't change that label, I'd be sure. And I think, I, well, we can be, <laughs> if we live long enough, we can have a better list and see, <laughs> uh, see if it, it, it does become, uh, I won't even make up a name for it. But anyway, I think it will uh, continue to call itself a university. And I think <coughs> that brings with it some uh, opportunities and some possibilities which even the most determined remaking can't quite wish away. So I don't know that I'm, as you said at the beginning, optimistic about the force of neoliberalism. I don't think I'm very optimistic about it. But I do draw some comfort from the thought that universities have become <coughs> the major home, they're not the only home, but they're the major institutional home for society to pursue this kind of reflective understanding and transmit it to subsequent generations. And I don't see it abandoning that altogether. Indeed, easily. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned Haldane, and as you well know, Haldane was a very great Germana part. And when he said the soul of the nation, I wonder if he didn't have in mind that the Humboldt University from 1860s was not merely concerned with building, but was also still with the nation building. <laughs> building a nation, expressing the language with Hegel, building a kind of flesh up with the physicists and you. Do you think that's so? In which case, I'm wondering whether some vice chancellors here might not seize on Brexit for a new role, for something which we want to do in this called British public. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, just to say you're absolutely right about that um, German inheritance. I mean, when people talk about um, the, the modern university, I think by and large we don't put it further back than the early 19th century. And obviously, there are institutions which go back all the way to Bologna in the early Middle Ages, but um, the, the character that we recognise, I think, comes principally from that reformulation of. German universities, and especially Humboldt's idea of research in the 
early 19th century. Um, it's interesting, of course, that uh, in the normal way of thinking about the ranking of universities and what have been achieved in them over the last hundred years, German universities don't figure very highly in that conspectus. That's one cause for reflection about it. Um, about what um, vice chancellors might seize on, I need an even less of an authority. Uh, but uh, I can certainly see that um, there could be, I mean, one of this in a way goes back to Bob's question, I mean, the, the workings out of the political dimensions of neoliberalism are many and various. And one of the workings out can be, as we know from national politics across Europe, a kind of nativism in particular societies, a rebellion against precisely the universalizing and de-lacinating force that the modern economy provides. And that, of course, might be people to want to return to some notion of a university as almost a seminary of national interest. I mean, that would seem to be a disastrous uh, move if it happens. But, I mean, I, I can see that if we... I made some joke about uh, the education equivalent of UK, but perhaps I shouldn't make that joke too lightly. <laughs> that could actually be one conception of a future university. Um, yeah, yeah, please. Um, thank you very much. It occurs to me, this is not strictly about the literature, but there is an assumed membrane that separates those within, say, the humanities and those without, you know, those, well, I suppose in literature too, those without are the ones who are pushing the individual agenda, and those within are sort of making the arguments in these more interesting ways about what we have to say. Um, but the things like, you know, new the BBC 3's New Generation Thinker scene and, and various opportunities. Um, now in which young, I'm just looking at historians because I'm sort of starting out in that group myself, um, can be sort of maybe attained to you thing or you know, sort of promise groups with public intellectual. It just sort of struck me that actually from within, in this sort of, sort of supposed pursuit of um, untrammeled free inquiry, there's actually a lot of people who are very, very happy to just to, to take on an extremely competitive model of um, potentially attaining fame. And, um, and, and as someone who's just sort of very much thinking about the future of academia, maybe my future, um, it occurs to me that there's this, a, a high degree of competitiveness that um, academics themselves are all too happy to take on. And in, in many ways, they can be more capitalist than the most capitalist capitalist, and it can be an extremely corporate environment. And so I just wondered how that fits into your vision of the, um, of the future, I suppose, sort of enemy. I mean, it's not, it's not. No, 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 it's, no, it's a very fair point. Um, I mean, I think a lot of the things that we might all um, recognise in a diagnosis of reasons to worry about the contemporary situation of the universities in this country, as well as elsewhere, um, are things which academics have colluded in in various direct and indirect ways. Um, you, know, just, you didn't mention it, but maybe back of your mind, I mean, one that I think uh, stands out is the way in which um, career making has come to mean, in effect, pursuit of certain research on external achievement and neglect of teaching or internal career. But one of the reasons why universities often now are run by people who are unsympathetic to the basic enterprise is because those who are engaged in the basic enterprise don't take their turn in running things. So not just the truth. I, I, I like to preach to academics that if we want these institutions to um, pursue the values that seem to us to matter about education and scholarship, then we have to take our turn in running them to try and do that, not to feel. And it's become almost a sign of being a great success as a contemporary academic, how much time you are away from your own institution. If you get the kind of grant that enables you to stop teaching or not take on the administrative role and pursue research, you, you'll, you'll get a little picture in the newsletter and you'll get a pat on the back and it's very nice chance. Um, that seems to me a pattern that we need in some sense to reverse. And that's a, that's a case where I think academics have very much to do with this. Um, actually, the, um, on the detail of the um, new generation thinker scheme that you mentioned, I mean, that, that actually seems to me a, a very welcome development. That is to say, to get people to talk to wider audiences about the kind of work that we do. That's, Anything which is available in limited numbers is going to be, once it's competitive, if not everybody wants to do it, it's going to be given an opportunity to do it. Um, but it doesn't seem to me that it's in some sense uh, alien to the activities that as teachers we 
to anywhere. Um, if you can talk about your research <coughs> on the radio in a way that interests lots of people, that's me. that seems to be a very, not just admirable, but a very consistent part of being a university teacher. So that particular example I'm not so worried about, but I agree about the general competitiveness and the general degree as it were of responsibility academics have for some of the things that have threatened or do threaten universities. I agree with them. Okay, Tom. Um, you gave us what I thought was um, a very useful antidote to any apocalyptic thinking about the future of possibilities for the universities. But I wonder whether that is not to think that apocalyptic thinking can only be of one kind. Because one view of apocalyptic thinking would be this is the end of the university. This is a, um, it would be a kind of modern version of Reading's notion of what's, what's happening. But a very different apocalyptic form of thinking would be to say that, yes, certainly universities following their basic function will persist in some form, but not the number of them with access to the proportions of the population that currently exists. And there will be a reinvention, a reinscription of a dividing line of higher education, where you're probably right, universities will still call themselves universities, but will actually be ERSAT's universities, uh, not real universities. And that's part, arguably, of what the government intends by the deregulation of universities to allow private for profit providers to come in by training. And if, we, if that's true, if, if, if there is substance to that anxiety that some of us with an apocalyptic vision of that kind have, then that is no reason for complacency about the survival of universities as such. There's a very good reason to be very concerned about the survival of universities with the current ambit and access to people that currently exist. Well, I agree with that entirely. I don't, I don't think I want to be complacent about the kind of universities. I want to draw a model, as it were, from this recovery of literature. But, I mean, as you say, again, I'm pleased, as I've said on other occasions, um, one, one uh, aim and one perhaps likely outcome of a lot of the changes in this country um, is that certain kinds of um, education were only going to be available to people with existing social and economic advantages. Um, I think this is something where we could learn a lot more from the American example than is normally assumed. Um, the fact is American higher education is heavily stratified by social and economic advantage. Um, and the so-called needs for transmission and so on doesn't really disguise that. And it's very striking that the <coughs> mean average income of undergraduate students of Harvard is $440,000. Um, that has also to take into account the number of the number of full scholarship that is about that kind of So I think that is a very real threat in this country given the current uh, government policy about universities. Whether that is all that universities will be, in other words, whether there will be some um, plush, people are going down, finishing schools for the children of the lot, and some pens in which to hold our fruits and lovers. <coughs> I'm not so sure. I mean, I don't think I'm, I mean, maybe I'm less pessimistic than you, I'm not sure. Um, but I don't think you can tell about that. But certainly the facts, uh, one danger of current policies, I think, mean, is the time. Perhaps here with a continental idealism 
which perhaps even reminisced through Weyland up against the, uh, the scientific management of the 19th century, which he reigned against. And I think that, that again, you can see it in France with the, the uh, scene perhaps of the, the Grand Écart with the, the Sorbonne, for example, there is a tension there. Just as in capitalist West Berlin, you saw the foundation of the free university and a technical university alongside it. I think it was trying to, if you like, deal with that dialectic between, if you like, the idealistic intellectual and the instrumentalist serving the state or a particular political institution of that time. Moving on to ourselves, sorry if this sounds a bit rambling, but you worry, I suppose, when it was founded as a university, shocked many of us who heard of Robbins and what he saw of a university. And that linked, particularly to the car industry, caused shockwaves, I think, amongst many of us teaching at that time. So, aren't we faced with the, the sceptical argument, perhaps, that all we can do is to hope that the activities that we get up to as teachers in a wide range of systems effectively become instrumentalists, in a way, to work not for the idea of the university, but that idea made concrete in the reality of the instrument of the universities of that process. I think I'm not sure quite what the worry about that is. I mean, I always want. <laughs> well, I, everybody's telling me tonight I should worry more, I can see. <laughs> but, um, what I meant was, um, it would be foolish to think when you work and teach in a university that a lot of what you're doing is not best described in instrumental terms, because it is. Mm -hmm. all kinds of practical but it could be instrumental to our activities. Sorry, that could be yeah, it's it's on the side. Side. Yeah, no, but I'm not sure I'm going to get that far in responding to what you say, because, uh, as I say, I, 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 that form of practical purpose directed activity, whether bearing upon research or upon teaching, seems to me to be uh, a long-standing feature and not necessarily a minimal feature of the kinds of education you might want to impart. Um, I wonder if you're worrying more that there was more cultural commitment in maybe the 19th century, uh, particularly as we said in Germany, to a conception of culture which was, as it were, um, unsullied, as they might have put it, by any practical or instrumental consequence. <coughs> I don't know. I, mean, I don't know if you did mean that, but that seems to me to have not been required by the notion of practices of universities uh, ever since. So, so I suppose I don't feel that we should panic about the identification of some of the practical things that we do. Just as, I mean, I can only say this very briefly, and I know putting it briefly will be open to misunderstanding, but I mean, there's not necessarily um, an intrinsic contradiction between wanting to try and help people extend their understanding and <coughs> helping them get some form of employment and later life. Those two things uh, seem to me at least as easily to sit together as they do apart. So I'm less bothered by any of those descriptions of the, as it were, the instrumental purpose of much of what we do. Okay. Um, thanks. I think this probably links to what you've just said. And I just want to put your thoughts of Kelly Fasser's. Um, oh, please, sorry, thank you. Of Kelly Fasser's idea of the popular university, where actually rather than being completely autonomous, you actually have as your purpose social change and justice and actually work in co-constructing with people in communities a kind of shared learning and understand that knowledge is embedded in power dynamics and that you actually have an instrumentalism but 
with an ideal of social justice and social change. So rather than a capital university, she, she turned uh, all your autonomous university into a popular university. And I just wondered what you thought of that, those kinds of ideas that she started to try to say. Right. Well, I should say uh, straight away, I don't know her work, so I can't speak directly to that. Um, but I think just the one remark I would make is that I am, and you probably would predict this from the things I said in the talk, um, I am very wary of um, attempts to justify what universities do in terms of their contribution to some form of social justice. Not because the way we have to be committed to social justice, just the universities are, I think, primarily set up in order to do that. And there will be times, there are times, surely, when some of the goals, often now spoken of in terms of social mobility, um, some of the social goals and some of the, what we might call more purely intellectual goals, may clash. And uh, I have to say, I think that clash is not resolvable in favour of social justice as far as universities are concerned. So I don't know what this person you mentioned particularly opposes. I mean, there are very many forms of um, cooperation with and as you put really co-teaching and co-education that you know from other kinds of education, adult education and so on, could be very fruitful. But if the overriding purpose is to achieve something you know, we think of as a political goal of that kind, uh, it seems to me that may be at the expense of something else, intellectual, institutional, and university. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to they go alongside. She certainly knows your work because she oh turns your approach to being an autonomous <laughs> university. But I just wondered if there are different types of university, you know, that some may be more autonomous than others, and some link more into sort of different types of purposes. I, I, I'll be very brief because I feel I could just repeat myself, but I mean, I think many of those very desirable social goals seem to me to be things that are often furthered by universities. They don't seem to me to be the defining purpose of universities. Okay, weird, fine, problem. Well, weird, yeah. Um, when defending universities, I was wondering if there, there's not something to be said for occasionally being conservative and or elitist, which was something that you mentioned a couple of times as, you know, this is not what I'm doing, but I'll leave it at that. And it <laughs> well, I think, I mean, there are many good reasons to disown being those things, partly because I think they're used as cheap jibes uh, against <coughs> the university. Um, and uh, especially since in Britain, over the last um, few decades, we've seen a very dramatic <coughs> expansion of higher education. And that seems to me part of a wider democratisation that I would want to defend and, and support. And so uh, I don't think we in trying to articulate some notion of university's purposes, we have to be committed to opposing that expansion. And that, but let me finish, because that's, I think, what the charge of conservatism or elitism often means. You must be defending you know, some idea that could only exist when 6% of the age cohort went to university. This idea can't coexist in a world in which 45% go to university. Well, I don't think that's true. Um, so that's why it seems to me those labels or those charges are worth rebutting. Um, I would say, getting myself in even more hot water than I have already this evening, I would say, because there is a sense, and I don't know if this is behind what you're asking, but there is a sense in which any form of demanding activity could be described as elitist, because not everybody is going to do it equally well. Um, and in that sense, you know, professional football is elitist, um, and so is research in particle physics. Um, and 
Uh, in a way, I think it goes back to this lady's question over here for me. In that case, it seems to me the people who are best at it have to be the ones who are given the opportunity to do it at the highest level. And that's where sometimes that can be uh, potentially in conflict with other social goals. Okay, Tom. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering, does or can the university coherently exist outside of its concept in the text? The text um, outside, of what, sorry. outside of its concept in the text, both the text that you've outlined and the text that you haven't. Um, if it does exist outside of this following regime, then what is it? Um, and if it doesn't, does neoliberalism, neoliberalism in its way of reconstituting things that were previously touched by economics to an economic logic, does that provide a new form of enemy rather than just a new content of opposition? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I've quite grasped this, but <clears throat> um, just, just on your first phrase, I mean, there are lots of things you could say about universities which should not be said by this literature. I wasn't saying yeah, yeah, that no. this, uh, in some sense, covers the waterfront. I mean, this has got a particular uh, literary character. <clears throat> Which is what I was trying to bring out and talking about it as a genre. Um, but the second part of your question, just, just perhaps you could elaborate it for me, is whether the current form of neoliberalism, is this a version of saying it's, a, it's a, an unprecedented challenge? I was just wondering in your opinion on that, if it was unprecedented or not, maybe following Mark. Um, but then I was, the reason I asked a bit about the text and the concept in the text is you highlighted how many, there are so many different readings of the university and how everyone wants to get back to, and lots of people are experts in reality. I was wondering if that reality actually exists outside of all these concepts, of the, whether there is actually the solid university that exists. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I can, I can be very much helped to you. I mean, uh, a, a lot of the um, debate surely turns on um, financial and managerial features of the current state of change universities, um, which, um, I mean, we, we, which, are, which are not principally textual matters. Put like that. I mean, there, there's a lot we could say about this in terms of what actually happens in these institutions at the moment. Um, only some aspects of the outcome of that seem to me to relate very directly to the tradition of writing that I was talking about. There would be many other things to say uh, uh, about you know, the whole question of power and recruitment and financing universities. But uh, beyond that, I'm not sure I can go on to the question. Okay, can we say thank you to Stephen for the great